Why Campus Matters was a SCUP presentation at Arizona State University. Garen, Hajrisolaha, and Fisher participated via WebEx with Hagen's on campus. This edited version includes portions of previous interviews. Why does campus matter? Particularly in a world that's increasingly digital and a world that is responding to an on-demand economy. In this session, we will hear from four vo voices. A sociologist who uh, works in the area of cultural authority of science and it's uh, the significance of place for human behavior and social change. An urban planner whose dissertation, The Morphology of the Well-Designed Campus, I love that title, is the first research to quantify the significance and the relationship of physical characteristics of campuses to student success. The third speaker we'll hear from is a writer and architectural educator whose current work looks at the implications of the third industrial revolution on architecture and cities in the 21st century. And me, a former university architect and teacher, and I'm writing on the physical implications of the digital transformation of higher education. And you can follow my work at campusmatters.net. Campus matters because it's a setting for specific kinds of conversations. Conversations about ideas, about the past and the present and the future. Conversations that are personal for today's participants. And conversations that have been going on for a long time. Still, as the need for synchronous place and time evaporates, investments in the physical campus will be questioned as never before. Economics and digital options are weakening the foundations of all of this enterprise. And for campuses to be justified, they must provide values that are not available by other means. The question is the balance between the virtual existence and the physical existence. That, it seems to me, is the key, is the key question. And it's gauged for the student as well as the faculty member, as well as the institution. The institution needs to fulfill its mission and satisfy its business requirements. But for the student and the faculty, it's a different calculus uh, for them. So technology tips in the direction of moving away from 100% from placed-based education. But it never reaches the point of being 100% placeless. Will, in fact, be, continue to be an important kernel that is at the heart of the institution. That's a physical expression of itself. Uh, the place one takes a picture of in that kind of superficial way. But that's an expression of or a manifestation of those places where people come together to work on serious ideas, create new knowledge, and in fact uh, improve the life of the future. Physical campuses have long uh, been synonymous with their institutions. They've been one and the same. They were built for sharing place and time. And in the 21st century, that relationship is becoming uh, malleable, no longer linked in the way that it used to be. At the same time, when I'm in class, I see the fragmentation of time. My students, they're operating in the nearly now just like many of you are who are taking a look at your third screens or your second screens or whichever screen it is you might be checking at the moment. <clears throat> Difficult to count. 
In any case, there, is, there are relatively less occasions where we're face to face, and by virtue of that, we're in an asynchronous realm in which context is as fluid as bricks are solid, and digital alternatives are everywhere all around us. And our students live in that both and world. This fluidness challenges long-held beliefs about authenticity and the importance of synchronous place and time, yet changes in this instruction made possible by uh, digital transformation are rippling out all over this country and, in fact, all over the world here at ASU. And institutions are becoming both physical and digital. In this both and world, it is difficult to quantify the physical consequences of this transformation. But take, for example, that in order for, well, the way to say this is all of the online students who were in class last year would have needed 50 million square feet of classroom in order to be able to take their courses. That's a significant implication and it plays out in a variety of ways and they're only seen through the thicket of business issues. Folks, Brian Alexander among others, calling it a queen's sacrifice when institutions decide to change their mission in ways that, uh, where they jettison a portion of their program. And it's becoming clear that the existential threat to institutions extends far beyond the small liberal arts colleges that folks have been writing about for several years. In fact, in the news in the last couple of weeks, we have reports of similar tactics being contemplated at places like UC Berkeley, LSU, and Ohio State. The, the idea of a truth spot is that places lend credibility to claims. Lend is a weak word by intention. It doesn't determine anything, but it's available. Why don't you think about this question? Um, what kind of truth are we talking about such that this place is the best kind of place, materially, spatially, architecturally, in order to make that truth? I'm thinking, hmm, okay, what kind of truths do we have out there? Scientific, religious, legal, identity claims, historical truths. For each type of truth, what kind of place is perfect for making that kind of knowledge, that kind of truth? Put another way, how does a place lend credibility to different sorts of truths? Hmm. So my point is, what's a university? It's, it's the collection of brains, it's the instruments to do what you're going to do with them, it's the people to know what to do with them, and most importantly, to be able to say, I've got an idea, okay? Starts with that. It's not a claim yet, it's not truth yet, but I've got an idea. All the necessities are at a university to convert, I've got an idea into, that's a truthful statement about the way the world is. And that's, to me, what makes the university a truth spot. Three factors, compactness, connectivity, and context, they were highly correlated to each other. And they, can com they could be conceptualized and combined in one bigger uh, variable, which I, can call, call, which I call the degree of urbanism. So, so let's take a look at those. Compactness. What's the density of campus? So I measured it. Uh, by looking at um, the mass space proportion of campuses. And that's one uh, indicator. Another indicator was the level, the percentage of surface parking on campus. More surface parking, less compact. And more open space on campus, less compact. And another factor was the proximity of buildings together. Buildings becomes more uh, closer to each other, more compact. So I measured those variables, uh, combined them together, and that becomes my compactness factor. Okay. Okay. And the next factor was? Connectivity. Okay. 
and it talks about uh, the connection of street network internally on campus and to its surrounding, to the surrounding of the campus, how well connected the campus is uh, to its surrounding. Okay. And the and third, third one, factor. the third factor was context, which is basically how urbanized the surrounding of campus is. A shortcoming to our fields, architecture, urban design, uh, where we tend to see a space and we give it a name, this is a classroom, this is an office, this is a cafeteria, and we uh, don't think about those spaces uh, over time. And um, in, my, in our college, we actually did a kind of time map of space use, and it was fascinating, the, the number of gaps, the amount of space that was just kind of sitting around. Um, and so I think thinking about space in temporal terms uh, will also help us realize that we actually have a, an excess of space. And this is also part of the larger change that's happening in the economy. One of the things that I find interesting about the on-demand economy, the Airbnbs and the Ubers, for example, is that basically what they're saying is that we have way too many empty seats and cars. We have way too many bedrooms that are not being utilized on any given night. Uh, the new economy is squeezing a lot of the inefficiency out of the 20th century mass production, mass consumption economy that we've inherited. And I think the same thing is going to happen in universities. It's just a tremendous excess capacity of underutilized space depending on the time of day or time of week. And I think universities will do the same thing, the, and it will be forced to do this by the economy. It just makes no sense. So what would be an Airbnb equivalent in higher education? What would be an, Air, what would be an Uber equivalent in higher ed? It seems to me that those are the questions that campus planners need to start asking.